Savage, who has given her program membership uh, seminar. Um, Amy did her undergraduate uh, at the Evergreen State College, uh, and went to Western Washington University for her master's, and did her PhD at Rice uh, before coming to Rutgers, where she's now at Rutgers Camden, uh, and as I said, giving her program seminar. So please welcome Amy. Thank you for that introduction, and thanks to everyone who I met with today. I had really nice conversations, and I'm looking forward to any questions you guys might have after I finish talking. Uh, so the title of this talk is The Diversity, Resilience, and Nutritional Ecology of Urban Arthropods, focusing in a bit on ants. And if anyone has any additional questions, my email is just amy.savage at rutgers.edu. Pretty easy to remember. Happy to answer any questions later, too. So I always say thank you first, because it gets buried at the end. And like most ecology, this is a very collaborative group of studies that I'm talking about today. And in particular, I'll be talking a lot about what my students Danielle and Melissa have done for urban nutritional ecology of ants. And I just wanted to give a quick plug for the Fort Totten USDA Urban Field Station. If you want to do work, urban ecology research in New York City, they let you stay there for free, and it's, it's a pretty nice spot with a lab and places to live. Okay, so this is a great department for urban ecology, so I won't have to spend too much time, like I usually do, on why I even study ecology in cities, but I'll go over my reasons really briefly and then talk to you about arthropod diversity across urban habitat mosaics. So when we think about cities, a lot of times people see them as endpoints in urban to rural gradients. But if you really zoom in, like if you're flying over a city or using Google Earth, you can see that really what we have is more of a mosaic of low and high stress environments. And they're not present in a gradient. They are actually much more disjunct. So I'll talk to you about that. And then <clears throat> look at responses of urban arthropod communities to extreme weather. And that'll be focusing on Super Storm, Storm Sandy and how it affected Manhattan's arthropods. And I'll end with a fair bit of time talking about the ecology of ants eating our food. So that picture there is a bunch of fire ants on a Cheeto. <laughs> <laughs> One thing we know for sure, ants do not have a long evolutionary history eating dayglow orange chips. Okay, so why study ecology in cities? The first reason that I do it is that they provide us a glimpse of one possible global future. And that's kind of the trajectory we're on now. In this first image, it says anthropogenic biomes of the world. And so even back when I was in school, we were taught about biomes as being about elevation, geography, vegetation, climate. Now we have to define it also in terms of how humans interact. So this is a real shift in our thinking about how ecosystems work on this planet. And in addition to that, humans are becoming increasingly urban as a species. And this is an infographic that the UN put together showing human populations from 1900 projected all the way out to 2050. And the point here is that we're becoming more and more urban in 2008, we reached a point where more than half of all the humans on the planet live in cities. And if we look at how human population has grown, it's all been urban. So that rural population growth has really been flat since the 1900s. And then the third part of this is that there's this thing called the urban heat island effect, where cities are warmer than their surroundings. And interestingly, the amount of difference between cities and their surrounding protected habitats, like from Philly to the Pinelands Reserve. That amount of difference is about five degrees C, three to five, is about what's being projected from climate models for the entire planet. So what we have is a bunch of replicated experiments all over the planet where we're seeing how these changes in our local ecosystems can affect the organisms trying to live in those environments, and where humans are really part of the big part of the ecological story. So if you can't read that, it says carts full of dead to bury. 
This is a pictograph from when the Black Plague hit Europe. And it's essentially a story about urban ecology that people didn't understand. And there were dramatic human consequences, lots of loss of human life, so much so that we can see it in the genetic code of survivors, well, descendants of survivors. And so it makes the point that the species that share our cities are interacting with this a lot, and they have, they're really likely to affect human health and well-being. We don't have to go all the way back in time, though. This is a projection, projection that the CDC put together a couple of years ago about the risk of Zika virus in the United States. And as the circles get bigger, the risk is higher. What you can see is that this is really projected to be an urban problem. And so we do know that the species that share our cities do affect us. And the other side of that is that we also affect them. Now this is something that hasn't been examined as much, and it's a big part of what I'll talk about today. Okay, so when I decided to study urban ecology, I went to the most urban place I could find, and that was Manhattan. And this is an artist's depiction of what the island looked like before any development juxtaposed against modern day New York. And what you can see, obviously, is lots of transformation. So we have three times more space in the built environment than on the ground in Manhattan. <clears throat> oh, and this is work I've done with Rob Dunn, Steve Frank, and Elsa Youngstadt at North Carolina State University. But across all of those different habitats that we've really transformed, we see arthropods. And even though we don't often know even what species they are, we know that they're performing ecosystem function. Sometimes they're performing services, sometimes just services, but we have a poor understanding of either of those. So as I told you, I think cities should really be thought of as urban habitat mosaics, where we have this chronic environmental stress, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next slide. And it varies from places like city parks, especially the ones that are managed like forests that have very low stress, relative to places like street tree pits and sidewalks that have really high stress. And we were interested in comparing these very low stress environments of city parks to street medians, these islands of green in the middle of roads. And in particular, we started with Broadway. So this is a really interesting environment in part because it does have trees, it has understory plants, it has some soil, but it's pretty shallow because the subway system runs right under them. So uh, the first thing we want to do is compare these habitat types in terms of stress. And this is an ordination plot. This right here is a principal components plot where in these plots what you're interested in is the relative position of each of these points and relative to each other and also to some factor of interest. Here we're talking about, um, oops, this one, yeah. Here we're talking about habitat types, so those street medians and city parks. And what you can see is that the medians are much more similar to each other than the parks. The parks are more variable in terms of a lot of these environmental characteristics that we measured. And the other thing is, Compared to parks, medians are hot, they're dry, they don't have much leaf litter, and they're very small. We've also found that they have a lot more pollutants. And in 2011 and 2012, we went out and we surveyed arthropod communities on the ground. And this is the data for ants. This is a similar plot, it's a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling plot, but still one of those ordinations. And the big circles are just the centroids. And what you can see is that parks, again, are much more variable in terms of the ant species that are present than the medians are. But we were somewhat surprised to see how many species of ants we found in these street medians. Looking at 23 species of ants on Broadway. Now, it's about half of what we found in the parks, but it's still impressive that we saw so many ants over just a couple of years of sampling. 
If we look at kind of broadly at other litter arthropod groups, we can see that for the most part, a lot of them have higher abundances in parks than in street medians, which is kind of what you would predict given that stress comparison. But that's not true for all groups. Some groups did just as well in both habitats. Others did better in medians. Okay, so about a month after our last survey, <coughs> excuse me, Superstorm Sandy hit the coast. Probably a lot of you guys are here. I was down in North Carolina, but uh, so you know it pretty well. Uh, this was a pretty big storm, and it coincided with the storm surge. In Manhattan, streets were underwater for hours, salt water. And there's this kind of uniquely urban or at least human dominated landscape aspect of disturbance, and that's that giant vehicles came in in the cleanup effort and further disturbed really um, already water soaked landscapes. Remember the ants, are trying, ants and other litter arthropods are trying to survive in those environments. So this was a, an acute, acute disturbance that was quite intense. And so because we had that data right before, we could apply a before after control impact design where we looked at sites that we had already sampled, went back the following June and, and sampled them again. And then we looked at places that were under salt water for hours compared to places that were not. I'm gonna to talk to you just about before after in the interest of time and the story's really similar, so also in interest of your attention. So when we think about resilience, one of the big hypotheses that people are talking about right now is the idea of tipping points. And tipping points can come through as a result of chronic stress or acute stress. And the idea here is that if you have a couple of ecosystem states, you may have an, a chronic stressor that reaches a tipping point and you might be in an ecosystem like these blue points where there's no difference until a crash or you might be in one more like the red system where the variability around that mean really increases as you get closer and closer to that tipping point. In terms of acute stress, of course, you're not gonna get that warning signal because there's not the time for it. But some ecosystems are going to be better than others. Those are the ones that we call resilient ecosystems at recovering and getting back to the initial state. So this framework has been put forward as recently as a couple of months ago, but it doesn't think about these stresses as they occur. So we wanted to know what happens when the same acute disturbance affects habitats with really different levels of chronic disturbance at the same time. And one way we can think about this is through this idea of the tipping point hypothesis. And here, if you look at that dotted line, it's kind of year to year variation in arthropod community composition, abundance and diversity, which we had because we had multiple years of data. And we, under the tipping point hypothesis, what we expect is in the city parks that have really low stress, we're not gonna have a real strong effect on the communities of arthropods living in those environments as a result of the storm. However, the street median environments, we're expecting to have a really strong negative effect and that's because they're already under strain. They're already stressed. Putting one more stress on top of it leads to kind of going off this cliff of a tipping point. And so what we expect is to see much more negative effects of the storm in street medians than in city parks. The second question we had was, do stress-induced differences in community composition before the extreme weather event occurs influence that resilience to the storm? 
So is there something about those groups that we find in those environments? And there's some evidence from the literature about this hypothesis, this idea of species being dis adapted and disturbance tolerant. And this is from a, <clears throat> a study of coral. So there's parts of the world where coral bleaching really hasn't happened much in very shallow areas. And the hypothesis there was that they're already experiencing spikes in temperature over longer evolutionary time scales. And so when you have this climate, global climate change induced warming, it doesn't have as strong effects on their bleaching, on their coral symbionts. And so they wanted to test that experimentally. And what they did was they took coral and put them in pools that either experienced moderate levels of temperature variation and, and others in pools that had high variability. And then they pulsed heat at them. So they added an acute strain and found that, in fact, if they were in the highly variable pools, they did better. There was less coral bleaching after. So this idea that there's a tolerance to the kind of stresses associated with acute stress. And if that's what's going on in these medians and parks in Manhattan after a storm, we have opposite predictions. So in this case, we're going to expect the arthropods in the street medians to do really well, perhaps even better after a storm, but the ones in parks to really not do well because they haven't had that opportunity or they're not populated by species that possess those application adaptations. So this is what we found. If we look first at these blue points, that's 2012. That's right before the storm. And what you can see is that parks and median arthropod communities had significantly different composition. After the storm, that difference went away. So if we just look in species space, there's no way to tell whether a site was a park or a median based on the arthropod species that were present. And so the question is, what caused that change? Remember I showed you this already that we had these differences before the storm. After the storm, this is what we saw. And again, this is really coarse groups, but it was true at different taxonomic levels of resolution. Uh, so overall, there were reduced abundances for everyone after the storm. But the groups that had higher abundances in parks before the storm were the ones that were really vulnerable to the negative effects of, of the storm. And so the idea here is that the storm came through and really homogenized the diversity in this landscape. So what we can do is we can ask if the arthropods that are present in street medians relative to city parks before the storm may be predictive of their responses to flooding. So we call this, uh, you know, urban stress tolerance and flooding tolerance. Are they related? And in fact, they are. This is true at both the order and family levels. The pattern was the same at the species level for ants, but that wasn't significant, so there's a lot of noise. But uh, basically what we see is the groups that were present in much higher abundances in medians relative to parks before the storm are the same ones that were pretty tolerant to the flooding. Okay, so given that we have this, these data, we can ask if we can use the results from this study to make predictions about what we should find after other storms when we don't have the luxury of data right before the storm hit. So that's something that our, we have some new colleagues in Cuba who are collecting some samples for us. And we're basically looking to see if we see similar diversity patterns in places that were, were really strongly influenced by Hurricane Irma, which hit last year around this time. Uh, 
We're also looking at other kinds of storm-related effects and different responses. So they had a loss of an entire mangrove forest. We're looking at the consequences of that. We're also looking at species interaction diversity and what happens when you disassemble a mutualist interaction network after a storm, how does that reassemble? Okay, so now I'm going to start talking to you about the nutritional ecology of urban ants. And I'll start by talking this way, about this in a really human-centric way. How much do ants contribute to food removal services in our cities? So I took both of these pictures in Manhattan, but I could have taken them anywhere. These are really common occurrences in cities in this world. So we see a lot of food trucks, people eat near them, food is prepared near them, there's a lot of food waste around food tr trucks. We also see a lot of trash bins overflowing, and most of what's overflowing is food waste. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so. I think it's, it's pretty intuitive to realize that if you leave food waste on the ground, it can attract and support the population growth of species that are undesirable for humans. Species like rats and mold, and some that are even associated with risks to human health. What's less obvious is that even if you're good and you get that trash food waste into a trash bin, where does it go? It goes to a landfill. And in a landfill, it's part of a really big pot of fuel for microbes. And one of the consequences of microbes processing urban food waste is a lot of methane. Methane traps more than 20 times as much heat as CO2. And so if you do some quick back of the envelope calculations, we've got about 150,000 cubic meters of methane produced per year just in New York City. So basically, anything that urban animals like ants can do to remove that food before it gets to the landfill is going to be an ecosystem service, not just for people who live in cities, but for people all over the world because it contributes to this global problem. So as I said, arthropods are all over the city. Ants are one of the most dominant groups of arthropods in most habitats in the city. But they're not the only ones. We also see rats. And so I was doing this work and talking to a colleague and friend of mine, Jason, when she's south, and I said, I think ants are really important for urban food waste removal in cities. And he said, there's no way. Rats are in the same environments. A rat and an ant want a piece of pizza, the rat's getting it. And I just kind of let it go. And then about a month or two later, he emailed me because he had tried to trap rats using bait and ants had eaten all the bait before the rats could get to it. <laughs> yeah. So he said, let's, let's look into this. And so what I haven't told you yet is that outside of the really urbanized environments in these urban parks, especially the ones that are managed as forests, you don't see rats. What you see are native mice, you see a lot of birds, squirrels, you see other vertebrates, you just don't see the rats. So we decided to do a really simple study to look at this question. We left out potato chips, hot dogs, and cookies. They were either covered by a cage, so only invertebrates could get to it. And we have data showing that those invertebrates were all ants. And uh, then we had it open, so vertebrates and invertebrates could get to it. And we just left them out for 24 hours, came back and saw how much food was left. And we did this in city parks and street medians. So in ratty areas and non-ratty areas. So this is what we found. On the x-axis here, we have the site type. Those uh, black bars are inside the cage, white bars are outside the cage. And I'm showing you right here the data for the potato chips. So if we first look at the parks, we can see inside the cage, ants were removing some of that food. But 
the vertebrates were moving a lot of it too. So they're contributing, but they're not the major driver. The surprise comes in the street medians, where ants were basically removing just as much of that food as ants plus rats. So ants really are driving that service in the street medians. And just so you know, I didn't cherry pick. That was true for cookies and hot dogs as well. But I will say, in Jason's defense, we've done some later studies, and later in the summer, rats do win. So it's a more complicated story, but ants can win, and they do contribute to that service. And this was a study that really caught the popular imagination. Started with a little paper or article in the New York Times, and blew up until somebody drew a cartoon of me looking at ants in street medians. <laughs> Okay, so let's think about what it means from the ants' perspective that they're eating our foods. We'll start with seeing if they're actually getting most of their diet from eating urban food waste. This is work I did with my friend Clint Pennick, who's now an assistant professor at ASU, Arizona State University. And we were focused on the pavement ant. So this is the most common ant in cities all over the world. Was that a question? Okay. So we were using stable isotopes to, as a tool to understand these dynamics. And there's this interesting characteristic of our processed foods, and that is that we use a lot of corn in our processed foods. And corn has a C4 photosynthetic pathway, giving it a different carbon signature than other plants. So most of the plants that ants see are, are in the C3 pathway, corn is in the C4 pathway. So if we look at their bodies, at their cuticles, and find that most of their carbon is coming from corn, we'll see this shift along, oh, sorry, along this axis towards a more corn bias signature. And this has already been done for humans and for kit foxes, where we've seen about two and a half to three percent shift. What happened for ants? Well, we looked in parks, medians, and sidewalks of Manhattan, and indeed found as we got to more and more urbanized environments, even within the city, we see a more corn bias signature. And if we map the ants, we can see that that shift is about the same as what we see for other urban animals. And um, <clears throat> we did have a reviewer say, this seems like a lot of effort to show ants eat human food, but we do like that we had this kind of unbiased way to look at them and show that they're actually incorporating carbon from our food waste into their bodies. Okay, so we're going from a very complex diet of insect prey and their carbohydrate sources are things like insect honeydew and plant nectar that have a lot more complexity than hot dogs, potato chips, and cookies. So we know that shifting our diet as humans has affected us. There's so lots of studies about that. What does it do to ants that eat what we drop? So in ant biology, there's this really simple trial that we do. It's been done all over the world. What you do is you take that complex diet and break it up into its constituent parts in the same form. So we have these liquid baits, either water, salt water, sugar water, amino acids in solution, that's our protein, or extra virgin olive oil for the fat. So everything that you have in an insect body kind of broken up into the simplest form we can find. And then after two hours, you count the number of ants at each of these baits, and it tells you something about the biology of that colony. We did this at city parks and street medians. Before looking at the data, we did have some predictions, and that's based on the fact that this has been done so much in other places. So while it's been done all over the world, it's really consistently a story about sugars versus proteins. If ants have a lot of larvae in their colonies, then they tend to want more proteins. If there's not very many insect prey around, they tend to want more proteins. If there's a 
big worker force that just needs fuel. They tend to go for more of the carbohydrates, the sugars. And in some systems that are salt deprived, ants need salt in order to grow their colonies. So given that, we thought, well, there's a lot of salt around roads. So if there's a salt issue, it's going to be really small in medians compared to parts. And um, if there's a preference for proteins, it's probably going to be higher in street medians because there's fewer insect prey there. This is what we found. So looking at city parks, for the most part, they acted like ants. They went for sugars. In fact, I've, done, I've talked about this in schools, and usually the kids guess that it's sugar that the ants wanted. So, so that's pretty consistent with what people have found other places, but it's not protein that's the second choice, it's fat. That was a surprise. Then we looked at medians, and this is what we found. So overwhelmingly, they're choosing fats and then sugars are next. This is a story about sugars versus fats, not sugars versus proteins. So the initial thought was, maybe it's just species turnover. So there's somebody in the median who really likes fat. So we looked again at this pavement ant that's found in both parks and medians. And here's what we found. A really dramatic effect. So over 90% of pavement ants living in parks prefer sugar. Over 90% of pavement ants living in street medians prefer fats. So that's a pretty dramatic result. And this happened over two consecutive years. All right, so the next question is, is New York weird, right? <laughs> so I've actually done this now in five cities. We started in Philly Camden. We also did New Orleans, Chicago, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. And of course, we have Manhattan. I'm just going to show you Philly Camden and New Orleans because I did them at the same time, and they were the next pair that I did. So in 2016, I went to New Orleans. In 2017, my student Nia did. And we had seven paired medians and parks. New Orleans is great because there are street medians everywhere. It's really easy to find small green spaces there. Uh, I know most people think of other things, other reasons that New Orleans is great, but I think it's the small green spaces. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to know when we did these next set of trials, if there was something happening in a finer time scale. So, I wanted to look every five minutes for the first 20 minutes and then every 20 minutes for two hours to see if there was any kind of discovery, dominance trade-off, or any kind of interactions between the ants coming to the baits. This is what I found. So on the x-axis here is the amount of time. It ends in at two hours again. Y-axis is the proportion of ants at those baits. And the colors are, as noted above, the same baits. So really, I could have just come after two hours in this one. These are the street medians of, of New Orleans. And they really quickly chose fats and stayed there choosing fats. The next most preferred bait was sugars. But there was sampling of all those other bait types. And so Again, we have a story about fats versus sugars. In this really urbanized environment, it's fats that are winning out. Got that in the corner, just so you can see it. And this is what happened in New Orleans parks. So if I had gone after just two hours, I would have said, OK, they're like Manhattan's ants. They like sugars. But there was an early spike towards a preference for fats. And so there's something more complex happening here. And again, it's a story about fats versus sugars, not proteins. OK, what about Camden and Philly? We selected sites, again, that were paired across Camden and Philly. In 2016, Danielle, my student Danielle did this work. In 2017, my student Melissa did this work. Some of you might know Melissa. Um, and they were doing the same thing at the same time that we were doing the New Orleans work. 
So this is the street medians of Philly Camden. And what you can see is there's a lot more sampling at the beginning, but eventually a choice for fats, the next is sugars. In the parks, again, we see a more complicated story. And here it's kind of interesting because we have the opposite trend of what we saw in New Orleans, where if we had just waited two hours, we would have thought that the park ants in Philly Camden are really different from those in the other two cities. But in fact, it is again a story about sugars and fats with an early choice for sugars followed by kind of bolt. Okay, so Melissa was doing a master's in my lab and she was really interested in these dynamics and asked, how do human food subsidies, how does this urban food waste affect these feeding preferences? So the first thing she did was survey the amount of food that people drop and what the composition of those foods are. Looking at carbohydrates, uh, fats, and proteins. And over 80% of the food dropped, at least in Philly Camden, over two consecutive years, was carbohydrates. So basically what we're doing is feeding them foods that are really carbohydrate biased and that might influence their behavior. So she conducted this human food subsidy experiment, <clears throat> focusing now on Camden. So she had 20 sites and five blocks. Each of those blocks had a control and supplemented park, a control and supplemented median. And before the experiment, she ran these feeding trials and found no significant difference in the street medians in terms of the control sites or the supplemented sites. She did the same thing in parks, no significant difference. So then she applied this treatment. So it's pretty, right? It's cooked brown rice and fruit loops. Carbohydrate rich human food. And she basically maintained these treatments every three weeks where she removed the old food and added new food. And then at the end of the experiment, tried those feeding trials again. In medians, this is what she found. No significant difference. They really liked fats. And we already knew that, right? They were already over 90% choice of fats. So it's not surprising that her experiment didn't have much of an additional effect. What's interesting is what happened in parks. So after giving the ants in parks carbohydrate rich human food for three months, they started acting like ants in medians. They shifted towards more of a fat preference than a sugar preference. So we can ask now, these are predators. In a lot of systems, ants are the most important predators of insects. We can ask if there are any consequences for other insects as a result of, of these shifting preferences of ants. And one thing we can do is look at a place where ant predation was really important. And that happened in Hawaii. So it doesn't have any native ants, but they have, of course, invaded. And in 92, this guy Cole went to places invaded and uninvaded by Argentine ants. <clears throat> and so we can look at the groups of arthropods that were really vulnerable to ant attack in Hawaii after ants invaded, and compare that to the groups that were less or more abundant in street medians in New York City, similar to the last correlation I did. And here's what we find. So yeah, we have a really strong positive association, which of course isn't definitive, but it suggests that there might be some cascading effects for arthropod communities if we shift ant predation behaviors. Okay, so this is the hypothesis we're kind of going with, that we do have a urban ant feeding syndrome, and here's how it occurs. Urban stress reduces abundances of prey for ants, so they consume carbohydrate-rich human food to subsidize their diets. Leading to ants 
in these urbanized environments being fat starved. When they're fat starved, as soon as a group, an insect that they can eat lands in a median or another urbanized environment, they immediately get attacked by these ants, leading to prey levels being further reduced in this positive feedback loop in cities, simplifying communities. So to kind of test if this lack of insect prey has an effect on ant behaviors, we went back to New York, and you can see that because there's a taxi cab there. Um, and we gave ants, pavement ants, the choice of potato chips, cookies, or hot dogs, or crickets, which my friend Clint calls ant health food. And uh, so here's what we found. Again, we have the elapsed time on the x-axis, and now it's the percentage of pavement ants at each of these baits. And I've just got a dotted line at 25% because there's four baits. So that's about where randomness would be. And if we first look at the crickets, we can see an immediate choice where they very quickly came to the crickets. And then it kind of declines over time. And the human foods are pretty random, maybe a little uptick towards the end. Uh, so you might think that they started with a preference for the crickets, but that declined over time. But this is what these baits look like at the end of two hours. They took every speck of cricket, and then they started eating the human foods at about equal measures. OK, so the next step here is some work I'm doing with Chan Menke in Chicago and Terry McGlynn near LA, where we're thinking about one of the most consistent patterns in ecology, which is latitude diversity relationships. And if these changing behaviors of ants through feeding them this urban food waste can decouple those relationships. So we've got three gradients we're setting up, one on the west coast, one along the Mississippi, and one on the east coast. And we first want to conduct both of these types of feeding trials across all three gradients and doing street median city parks, but also surrounding protected areas, which I've already started to do in the Pine Barrens. And then we want to collect arthropod communities and see if we actually see changes in arthropod diversity at these different sites. And finally, we will experimentally manipulate human food subsidies, both in the field and in the lab, to assess ant predation behaviors. Okay, so with that, I will take any questions, and thanks for your attention. Go ahead. The compositional difference you see in the gradients between the medians and the parks, from the first experience you talked about, are there any median specialists, or is that difference just caused by species that exist in parks but not medians? Uh, so we had, we did have this one really weird group of, um, of Ponderan ants that are specialized hunters that were only found in medians, but they were found pretty rarely in medians. For the most part, they were a subset of what we found in parks. Anyone else? So are there um, particular fatty acids that they need, or do they just need lipids in general? I was uh, asking because the potato chips, I guess, are probably pretty high in lipids in general, but maybe not the, the fatty acid composition that they need. We're actually working on figuring that out right now. We've um, extracted lipids from ants. We have a colleague at, at Stockton University that's, that's assessing those. And the idea is that you know there are some some fatty acids that can be easily formed from the carbohydrates. There are others that it takes a lot more effort to do. And so he's predicting that we're going to see really just the simple ones present in the street medians compared to the city parks. But we're still looking to see that. Go ahead. How do you characterize the urban <coughs> stress? Is it salt stress? I'm asking because many species 
creators are so powerful because of the soul culture. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the, the, if, when they say the community would just create after the soul. That's a possibility. I mean, we were thinking of it as being a flooding issue, which it's salt water that's flooding them, so that's a water that they're not usually, if it's raining, it's not usually salt water. Uh, but it's also the groups that did particularly bad were also ones that were not able to move, the ones that weren't mobile. And ants are some of those, of course, because they have the queens in the colony. So if it's a long enough period, then they might not be able to do that. Um, so, I mean, I don't think it's one stress. Like I was saying, there's also the, the cleanup efforts. Uh, that's part of the idea of this disturbance tolerated organisms is that groups that survive after these acute events are, are already, already possess some adaptations to deal with that stress, right? They've been used a lot as indicators of ecosystem health, and it's largely because they are abundant and have ecosystem effects from the, you know, the tops of canopy trees to meters below ground. And, and so, and because we have a really good handle on their diversity relative to other groups. And so they've been used after fires, they've been used after, um, mining, they've been used after storms. So they're generally a really good group for that reason. Go ahead. So when you look at some of the other species that you find in urban environments, a lot of them seem to be cosmopolitan in that sense. And I'm curious about the portion of the answer. Are they sort of being cosmopolitan species or the subsets of the So we thought that the Exotic species would be more dominant in these communities. Definitely, there's the pavement ants that are the most dominant, at least in New York, and the fire ants that are really dominant down in New Orleans. So we have some of that. But we get pretty high numbers of native species, lots of Lasius and Formica, and um, some of the native Nyland area. We also get some exotic Nyland areas. So it's a mix but it's not as dominated by non-natives as we expected it to be. Uh, why do you think they're eating so little protein uh, in both the, the medium and the uh, heart? Yeah, that's the, that's the flip side of this, right? That we really are thinking, why fats? And the other side is, why not protein? And uh, that's one that I don't have a great answer for now. Can tell you that when we've done these trials in the Pine Barrens, it is proteins that they go for. So it's not the method that we're using. Um, we've also talked to some people who study ant symbionts that uh, it's possible they might have some symbionts providing them with some amino acids um, processing. So that could be something that it seems like kind of a stretch that the one place where that's really important is in the cities. So we don't have a really good answer for that. The other thing I think might be the case is that it's just a really stressful environment, so they need a lot more energy just to survive. And so maybe if you uh, took them out of the stressful environment, proteins would become more important because growing the colony would be a more kind of reproductive side instead of survival side would be more important. But right now, I don't have a definitive answer about that. So what about uh, the variation within the median area, such as a median area with just grass, or median area with grass and trees? I'm sure that they So um, in Manhattan, yeah. on Broadway, it's basically just trees and shrubs. Uh, we've done some work on the Lincoln Highway in Manhattan, lower Manhattan. It's mostly grass. We see the same effects. And in New Orleans, it's grass with uh, a few big oak trees at the perimeter. Uh, 
And so we do, we do see variation in the vegetation, but we still see this fat choice across the cities. Question? Uh, are there unifying traits that make an ant successful in a median versus a park? Because do they all share a similar life history? <clears throat> Um, that I don't know. The, the ants and medians, and we've got specialized predators that are able to survive in medians. We have ants that uh, only feed in tree canopies. We have the ones that almost exclusively eat human foods. We have a lot of variability there. In terms of the ones we find in parks, I guess, if we look for traits that kind of keep an ant out of the median, uh, phenogaster, which is kind of a classic seed dispersing ant. So it's, it's a native ant to eastern forests, or that's a genus, but the species within that genus, um, they, they're really common in city parks, especially the forested ones, but we don't see them at all in the medians. And, uh, we had this really weird effect one year where there were no Tapanoma melanocephalum, which are the, the odorous house ants. So the ants you find all over your house and you squish them and they smell like blue cheese. Never in medians. And, and we were like, why? Why is this non-native only found in parks? And then the next year we found them all over the place. So there is some variability. Thank you very much. Amy. Of course.